we thank God for another time when we can have a devotion and just gather together and study his word. So before we begin, let's take time and just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we exalt you, we bless your name. We give you glory, praise, and honor. We are here as your children wanting to learn from you. We ask that your Holy Spirit will come and teach us and just empower us to do that which we learn today, O oh God. We believe that it's not by might, by power, but by the Spirit, says your word. And so everything that we're going to study from your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit will give us revelation, your Holy Spirit will give us standing, understanding, your Holy Spirit will give us wisdom, and your Holy Spirit will give us knowledge. And your Holy Spirit will give us empowerment to go forth and be doers of that which we're going to learn from your word today. I thank you for everyone who's tuned in. I bless your name. I pray, Jehovah God, that Father, wherever they are at, in your wisdom and knowledge, may these words speak to them. May these words minister to them, O oh God, all to the glory of your name. For in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are glad to just have this time to share again, have this short devotion from God's Word. And today we're going to be discussing something very, very interesting, just relating to the season we are in, even as, as, as God is walking with us, as God is taking care of us, being our shepherd, being our shield, being our hope, and being our strength. Our devotion today is, is entitled, Being Ready for God's Next Move being ready for God's next move. And even in this season, as we believe that God is in control, God always reminds us by, by, by that he's in control by the, the steps he takes, the things he does, and how real he is to us. And his being in control is not just something we imagine, it's not something we, we, we are distant from. His being in control is very, very real to us. And I want us just to, to, to take time and just um, embrace that, believe that, and trust that even as God is going to make his next move, we are ready and we're prepared for God's next move. Uh, as we start our devotion today, I'd like us to turn to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 16. And we're going to read from verse 1 to 10. And... The, the key thing is I want us to understand is what is God's next move? When we say God's next move, what do we mean? What do we mean by that? So let's turn to the scriptures, the word of God, so that at least we're able to get that understanding. I'll read from verse 1 of Second Chronicles. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to ben king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Come break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will draw from me. So ben he did the king of Asa, king Asa, and sent captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. They attacked Iljon, Dan, Abel Maim, and all the storage cities of Naphtali. Now it happened when Basha had it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah, and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Basha had used for building, and with them he built Geba and Mizpah. Verse 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of king Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the, and the, and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord ran to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. 
In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. We bless the Lord for his wonderful word. Like I said, we wanted to know what is God's next move? What is God's next move? Now, we're talking about the next move. We're actually just referring to the future. What is the future? What is going to happen in the future? In our lives, there are two ways in which you look at the future. What is the next thing that is going to happen? Or the other way we can look at the future is what is God going to do? What is the next thing God is going to do? So we can look at the future in two ways. What is the next thing that is going to happen? Whatever it is. Maybe there's going to be a storm. Maybe there's going to be a major announcement by the government. Maybe there's just going to be some, someone's going to come into your life. Or we can look at the future is what is the next thing that God is going to do? So in those two ways, I'll handle the first scenario where I say, what is the next thing that is going to happen? As we've read, we're reading the story of King Asa of Judah. In that time, it so happened that the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was Judah and the rest of Israel. And there was war between Judah and the rest of Israel. And of course, in this story, as we read, Israel was the aggressor. So Israel, under King Basha, decided to attack Judah. And the way they did was that they put a siege around Judah. And so when Judah was under siege, from Israel, that means they were surrounded. The people in Judah were very concerned because no one would, would come in or go out. And so they were at risk of dying or starving to death. And so the king of Judah, who is Asa, decided, I need to do something. Because he was concerned, we are under siege, we are surrounded, and what is going to happen next? As long as we remain under this siege, we may remain this way, die, or we may get attacked and get killed. And so it was more like what you'd call a lockdown scenario. And in this day and age, lockdown is something which is a, a term that has become almost the norm. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm sharing with you, I'm in a city which is under lockdown. You're not allowed to go in or even come out in the city. So it's a bit of a, 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 a under siege scenario. And we're all waiting. So what is going to happen next? You know, what is going to happen next? So in the case of Asa, when he was under siege from Israel, he decided to do something about it. He waited and he said, okay, since we're under siege and we can't continue living like this, he said he was going to come up with a solution. And so he knew that Israel, who were attacking him, had an ally who was backing them. And the ally who was backing them was a nation called Syria. And so he decided, since they have this ally who's backing Israel, I'm going to give them, give them some gifts and convince them not to back Israel. And once he gave these gifts to Syria, and so... Syria decided to turn against Israel and, and now was supporting Judah. And of course, because of this, it means that Israel could no longer hold the siege around Judah. And as a result, Israel decided to withdraw. Now, during the time when there was this siege, when Israel was surrounding Ju Judah, they started doing some construction or building some cities. And they brought some material to build some cities. And of course, when things turned, and now because um, Israel could no longer hold the siege and they had to leave, they left everything which they had brought. And so for Judah, as a result of, what, of the action taken by King Asa, now they went over to these cities which Israel was building. They collected all the material and they came and built their own two cities. That was Geba and Mizpah. So if you look at this scenario where, they were, where Judah was under siege or under lockdown, the king was able to turn it around. He came up with a solution, which the end result was that 
Whereas at one point they were under lockdown, they were serving, now they even got more wealth and they were able to build a new city. So we can see the next thing that happened. It looked very good, it looked prosperous, and it looked beneficial. The only thing was they did not do what God wanted them to do next. If you look at Second Chronicles chapter 16 from verse 7 to 9, Immediately after Asa had managed to win the battle against Israel and the siege was withdrawn, a prophet came to the king and he had a conversation with him. In that conversation, the prophet who's the seer called Hanani, he accused King, king Asa of why did you rely on Syria to defeat the Israelites. You should have relied on God to defeat the Israelites. In verse 9, in verse 8, the, the, the prophet was reminding King Asa, in the past, when you're under attack from the Ethiopians and the Lubin, you relied on God and you're able to get victory. There were huge, the Ethiopians were a huge army. Lubin was a huge army. You relied on God and you're able to get victory. But in this case, when you're under attack from Syria, from, so from Israel, you did not rely on God. You decided to rely on Syria, and that is how you got your next victory. I've mentioned one thing, that what is God's next move? And the seer goes on to help us understand what God's next move is. In verse 9 of Second Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. The Bible is telling us here that God is constantly looking out for people whose hearts are towards him, so that he can show himself strong. God's next move is to show himself strong in a person's life, in your life, as long as your faith and your confidence is in him. God is looking for a chance to show that he alone is God. In this passage we just read, if you look at what had happened to, to Judah, they had been surrounded by Israel. God was looking for an opportunity to show the Israelites that his strength, sorry, the, 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 the Judah, to show Judah that his strength can defeat Israel. And that was God's next move. Something had happened. There was a lockdown. But God had a next move in mind. And so you see here where King Asa, he's under a situation. It's a siege or a lockdown. God has a next move in mind. But something happens that instead of the next thing being what God wanted to do happening, something else happens. And so as we've, as we've just tried to understand um, what God's next move is. And we're seeing here that when God's next move does not occur the way he wants to do it, there's always a problem. There's always a challenge. Even as, we, as we'll come back to this passage and see and see next and see and see again. I'd like us just to, 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 to reflect further on God's next move. And just as in the, in the passage we've read, that it's very important that God's next move occurs. Whatever he wants to do next takes place. It's very important. And so for God's next move to occur, like we mentioned our title, our, our subject today of this devotion is being ready for God's next move. How am I supposed to prepare myself so that God's next move takes place and Something else instead of God's move does not take 
place. So it means that we have a responsibility. So I ask Lucas, what is my responsibility in God's next move? What is my responsibility in God's next move? And we'll go back to the, the word of God. And I want us just to reflect on, 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 the, on, the, on the life of, of Daniel, who, who really seemed to understand his responsibility in God's next move. We'll, we'll, re- we'll read a few passages, verses, sorry, from, from Daniel chapter 1 and, and Daniel chapter 2. And because of time, I will just give an overview view of, of the, the, the summary of the story. But I'll read Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 and 2, then I'll go to give you just a summary of Daniel 1 and 2, and then we'll look at what is our responsibility in God's next book. In the third year, verse 1 of Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shina to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure of the house of his God. Verse 1 and 2 gives an introduction of the new situation that the Israelites have found themselves in. The temple of God has been desecrated, has been destroyed by the king of Babylon. He has come to this temple, which meant so much to the Israelites. He has picked up dedicated articles of God, he has taken them to the temple that he has for his idol. This is the king of Babylon, that is Nebuchadnezzar. Now, when God's temple was destroyed at this time for the Israelites, this was serious. God's temple meant everything to them. It is where they would go and pray, where they would go and worship. But now that it was destroyed completely, it was almost like they had, no, they had no place to go and pray. The Israelites had no place to go and worship. And they could not imagine that God's temple had been destroyed. This is very similar to the days that we're living in, where we found ourselves, all the churches are closed, and our believers are wondering, where do we pray? And now we have to pray from home. But like we mentioned in, our, in the beginning, being ready for God's next move. The temple, let's go back to what's happened in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2. God's temple has been destroyed. His articles have been taken to a house of idol worship. What is God's next move? What is God's next move? So, and I want us to look at the life of Daniel. He's living through this. He's going through this. He had grown up going to the temple to worship, to make sacrifice. But in his lifetime, the temple gets destroyed. What they considered holy articles, specialty, have been taken away to a house of idols. And when they see this, it's it's not something that they're, they're used to. But there is God's next move. As some of you are familiar with this story in Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2, Daniel was taken captive into Babylon. Into Babylon, They were raised up as, as leaders and rulers in Babylon. They were trained. And during that time of training to be a leader and a ruler in Babylon, Daniel made a decision. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. He said, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank, therefore, and he requested for the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. That decision by Daniel determined a lot of things. Because as you go on to Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream that no one can interpret except Daniel, The reason why Daniel is interpreting this theme is because of his decision never to defile himself. The consequences of that brought him into favor with God and even before the king. And so we are seeing that 
when all this happened in, in, in Israel, and they're in this scenario where the temple has been destroyed, and they almost have, they have no place to go and worship. God has a next move. But the next move was not clear. It was not revealed to Daniel. Daniel didn't know what was going to happen. You can imagine after verse 1 and 2 in Daniel chapter 1, the temple has been destroyed. They don't know the future. They know that now they're going as captives. But they don't know what is going to happen next. But God has a next move. But in this next move, the responsibilities are also with Daniel and the Israelites. There's a responsibility. And I want to just ask to talk some of these responsibilities. One of the responsibilities that Daniel had was consistency in upholding God's standards of holiness. We read in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. That consistency in upholding God's standards of holiness. When he purposed not to defile himself, he never ate defiled food for the next three years, even though it was something which was not generally acceptable. It was required that all those who were under training eat everything, but he purposed not to defile himself. Number two, Daniel focused on pleasing God. That was his responsibility. It was him to take up that opportunity to please God, that responsibility. And because he pleased God, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. When God, Daniel focused on pleasing God, they were equipped, they were blessed by God in amazing ways. The other thing that they took up as their own responsibility was remembering God's faithfulness in the past. When you remember God's faithfulness in the past, you hold on. Remember, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream and no one could interpret and people were supposed to be killed, Daniel remembered that because of the same God who was able to give us favor during our season of training, we were not eating defiled food. We only ate limited rations of food. He kept us healthier. We were stronger. We came out as better students than all of us, the rest of us. He knew this same God would be faithful in the interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. If you go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8, it reads, that's what the passage says, that, Were the Ethiopians, the Lubim, not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hands. In the case of King Asa, we are seeing how he forgot God's faithfulness when you're surrounded by the Israelites. Instead of remembering God's faithfulness in the past, he completely forgot God's faithfulness. That is why he turned to the Syrians for assistance. These are some of our responsibilities in terms of God's next move. Do we remember his faithfulness? And based on his past faithfulness, do we act based on that? The other thing about our responsibility in God's next move is to respond by seeking God's faith concerning the events. Remember when King Nebuchadnezzar had his dream and no one could interpret. Daniel responded and And he said, here's how Daniel responded when those in Daniel in Daniel chapter 2 from verse 14 to 19. Then with the counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companion might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, 
Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So I'm just reminding us of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And because this dream could not be interpreted, there was a decree to kill all the wise men. But Daniel responded by seeking God's face concerning what was happening. I just want to remind us that Nebuchadnezzar's dream was God's next move. The children of Israel have gone into captivity. The next thing God does is to give King Nebuchadnezzar a dream. That is God's next move. And the reason why God was giving this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar because he knew I have people in Babylon who have taken responsibility and they will act accordingly when I, Jehovah, make my next move. Now, often when we're in this situation, we're wondering, like now, with what is going on all over the world, the pandemic, the economic crisis, instead of wondering what is going to happen next, what we should ask ourselves is what is God's next move going to be? As we've seen in the word of God, Anytime there's a situation, anytime there's a crisis, there's the next move that God makes. That is why we always say our God is in control. Because no matter what is going, going on, he makes the next move. We are not victims of the circumstances. We are not left on our own. Now, As we, as, we, as, we, as we just continue with this study on being ready for God's next move, there are certain things that we always, um, the certain common things that sometimes we do that I find is a, is a norm, but it's not really the right thing. Often we start asking questions like, yes, this is happening, and so how, it go, how, it go, how is God going to use me? What is the next thing God is going to do? No? When will God's next move happen? I'd like to take us back to the story of Daniel, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And just to remind you that after Daniel and the went into captivity, they did not know that one day King Nebuchadnezzar would have a dream that would need interpretation. God did not forewarn them that I'm going to give this king a dream and when I give him a dream, it is you who is going to interpret that dream. So whenever God is going to make a next move, he never tells you how is he going to use you in that move. He might not tell you what is the next move he's going to make. We might never tell you when that next move is going to happen. So we should never dwell on that. I'll give us an example in Joshua chapter 1 from verse 1 and 2. God tells Joshua, and I'll paraphrase, my servant Moses is dead. So a situation has happened. It's a crisis. You know, Moses has died. And God never warned Joshua that uh, Moses is going to die. And the next move, God tells Joshua, you're the one who's going to lead the children of Israel into Canaan. And Joshua has to be ready for God's next move and embrace it. As we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, from verse 1 to 10, about King Asa, the sad thing is most of the time when God makes his next move some of us miss it. Like it happened with King Asa. He was in a siege. He was in a lockdown. And God had a next move concerning this siege and lockdown. But King Asa missed God's next move. And there are consequences to King Asa for missing God's next move. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8, 
he missed an opportunity to defeat his enemy. Remember God is asking him, I defeated the Ethiopians, I defeated Lubim. I was going to defeat, my move was to defeat Israel and to defeat Syria. But now because you King Asa have relied on Syria to defeat Israel, you've missed an opportunity to defeat Syria and to defeat Israel. We miss an opportunity to defeat our enemy. Another thing that goes wrong when we miss God's next move is that we become more self-reliant and hence open to more attacks. Remember what King Asa did? He turned to Syria for help when he was in a lockdown, in a siege. And things worked out. The siege ended. Israel went away. They even grew wealthy. They got a lot of wealth. And they built two cities. They were more self-reliant. But in verse 9, as we read, said, the last part said, In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. God was telling King Asa, because you relied on your, on your thoughts on other people, you are now open to more attacks. And more attacks mean what? More defeat. Number three of what happens when we miss God's next move. We can no longer hear God's voice. Remember, when King Asa did not rely on God, God sent the prophet, the seer Hanani, to come and correct him. And when the seer came, in verse 10, after the seer rebuked him, he said, Asa was angry with the seer and he put him in prison, for he was enraged. Here is a prophet of God, a man of God, coming to rebuke you. And how do you respond? You take him and put him in prison. It shows that the, the channel through which God speaks to you, you're shutting it. You no longer want, to, you want it to be open. And you're in a situation where you're silencing the prophet of God and hence you no longer hear God's voice. When we miss God's next move, our deeds become foolish in God's sight. I'll go back to 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. It says, the latter part, it says, In this you have done foolishly. God told King Asa, When you took articles, the gold and the silver from the temple, and you gave to Syria, and you got your deliverance, you did a foolish thing. None of us would like to be foolish in the sight of God. None of us would like that. The final thing that happens when you miss God's next move is that we bring God's judgment on ourselves. Verse 10 of 2 Chronicles chapter 16 says, Then Asa was angry with the seer and he put him in prison. For he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. You can imagine what happens when a servant of God is doing the work of God and you respond by putting them in prison. You respond by punishing him for no wrong. He's innocent. King Asa was simply bringing God's judgment on himself. And if you read, if you read the latter part of, of 2 Chronicles, um, chapter 16, Asa became ill and he suffered and God's judgment was upon him. So, a word of caution. As believers, we never want to be in a situation where, yes, we are suffering, we are in trouble, things are bad. But we miss God's next move concerning where we are at. In spite of what is going on, in spite of the lockdown, in spite of the siege, the worst thing that King Asa did was to miss God's next move 
concerning how God wanted to react to that lockdown. There's a blessing in being a vessel in God's next move. Just like we had read from Daniel chapter 1 and chapter 2, the story of Daniel. They were in captivity. Israel were now slaves of Babylonians. But in that situation, God had a next move. He had a next move. He never revealed it to Daniel beforehand. We all know God had a plan to use King Nebuchadnezzar in many ways to show himself as God. The first thing was one of the first things he did, not the first thing, the one of the first things he did, I think the second thing was he gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. A dream that no one could interpret. A dream that was a threat to every um every one of the of the magicians, the wise people, the rulers in Babylon, Babylonia. This dream was a threat. But that was God's next move. But Daniel was available as a vessel in God's next next move. He was available to be the interpreter of the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. And you all remember what happened when Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. King Nebuchadnezzar bowed down, confessed and declared that Daniel's God is a true God to the glory of our Father in heaven. And so, I want us just to mention a few blessings when you are a vessel for God in his next move. If we read Daniel chapter 2 from 46 to 48, Daniel 2, 46 to 48, the Bible says that when Daniel interpreted that dream, he was promoted to a very high rank in the Babylonian kingdom and to a position where he could do more for God. The other blessing of, of us being a vessel in God's next move is in, I'll go back to 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord ran to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, now you shall have wars. When we give, if Asa had allowed God to use him for his next move, and that was to defeat Israel, his next move to defeat Syria, his enemies would have been defeated and Israel would have been living in victory without any wars. When there are no wars, we live in much victory to the glory of our God. Finally, when we use as a vessel for God's next move, other believers are blessed through us. I'll go back to the story of Daniel. When Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's king dream, Remember, not only Daniel was promoted, the other three Hebrew boys who were with him were also promoted. That is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Other believers were blessed through Daniel. And so for me, if I'm this situation right now, where yes, there's a crisis. Yes, there's all this going on. Yes, there's all this fear and worry and concern. Yes, there's confusion. The best thing I can do is to make myself a vessel ready to be used for God's next move. And remember, God's next move, I may not know it. I may not understand what it's going to be. But when he moves and I'm available for him to use me, I will not only be blessed but even other believers around me shall be blessed to the glory of our God. I want to bring this to a conclusion as I remind us of 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. That in this time we're living in, in this year that we're living in, 
in this month of May that we're living in. That God's eyes are running to and fro throughout the world, looking for hearts that are loyal to him, that he may show himself strong. In spite of what has happened, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of what is going on, God is looking for men and women that he may show himself strong, that he may show the world through you and I that he's still God, that he may silence all those who think he's defeated, that he may silence all those who think that his church is dead and useless. God's eyes are running to and fro across the world looking for you and I to find us if our hearts have faith in him, if our hearts have confidence in him, that he may show himself as God to the glory of his name. And to conclude this by reading this statement. We are now at a point on God's calendar where our responsibilities are greater than ever. We are more in need of God's wonders than man has seen in all the past centuries in this planet. Amen. Let's believe and pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you reminded us that we should be ready for your next move. That our eyes should be focused on your next move, not what is going on around us, not on our own, our own plans, our ideas, our ways of resolving things. Our eyes, our hearts, our minds should be confident that since you're in the control, you have the next move. And Lord, you're looking for men and women whose hearts are towards you. You're looking for men and women like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're looking for women like Esther. Lord, whose hearts are towards you, that for such a time as this, you may show yourself strong. You may show yourself great. You may show yourself mighty. You may show yourself powerful. Lord, I pray for everyone who's listening to me that we will turn our hearts towards you. We will choose to rely on you. We will choose to put our faith and confidence in you. We will choose to live lives that are holy, that are righteous and pleasing to you like Daniel did. We will choose Jehovah God to be set apart, to be separate, focusing on you, Lord waiting upon you, trusting you and believing you, Lord. For God, your next move is coming. And your next move, when it comes, Lord, we want to be found like Daniel. We do not want to be found like King Asa. Lord, we trust in you, Lord. Help us not to be a hindrance to your next move. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I exalt you and I bless you, Lord. May you be glorified and may you be exalted, O oh God. For in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. 